Welcome to Fortitude. I'm Aldo Lou Dennis, General Partner of Initialize Capital, and today I'm joined by Avantha Arachi, CEO and founding team member of A-Frame Brands. Avantha, thank you so much for coming, and please tell us a little bit about A-Frame Brands. Yeah, of course. Thank you for having me. A-Frame is a company that incubates, develops, and launches personal care brands that are founded by celebrity talent, but also focused on underrepresented groups. And so right now we have three that we've already announced. The first is Kinlo, which is Naomi, Naomi Osaka's son care line, focused on people of color. Our second is Proudly, which is our baby care line, also focused on babies of color. It's founded by Gabrielle Union and Dwayne Wade. And then uh, we recently more announced a uh, partnership with John Legend um, that we'll be talking more about soon. This is our first time meeting in person, so I'm very excited to chat with you a little bit about your experience, not only with A-Frame brands, but prior to A-Frame brands. Uh, can you share a little bit about your background and how you came to be the COO and uh, you know on the founding team of A-Frame? Yeah, of course. So I actually started, I have a very non-traditional path into this uh, type of role. I started out as a behavioral analyst way back when, working at a police department and also in a lot of different labs. And so my foundation is in psych. My foundation is in data and people and systems. And that covers, that colors a lot of the way that I think about the world today, the way that I think about how businesses can grow, how you can build things, how you can be able to, to make change. But eventually that led me into, uh, the, it, I kind of wanted to steer clear a, a little bit more about of academics and, and I thought it would be interesting to be able to start working into startups and when the foundational elements of things. And I found a home there. I found that actually a lot of the things that I didn't like about academia, about working on things and experimenting to be able to publish, you could actually experiment to be able to create impact in startups, which was so much more, um, uh, gratifying. So I fell into startups, started working in the people world and in special projects, which is very like operational oriented and getting things done, um, and uh, popped around until I then also let, uh, dove into consulting and trying to help companies grow and then also transform and shift gears, again, heavily in people world, the people world and also just in being a Swiss Army knife for companies. And that led me to working with Ari, who is the founder of A-Frame Brands, at actually another initialized company, Avametric, previously, which was amazing. Um, and we brought that company through to an acquisition. He went off to kind of like explore things. I stayed with the uh, acquiring company um, and explored things there until I launched my own consulting practice. And by the time that I had been doing that, Ari started developing the, con the beginning stages of what A-Frame could be. And we had always stayed friends. We would always, I would go to LA and, and have dinner with him and his family. Um, and we'd talk about this idea of what, it, what, what he was building and what, what the concepts of A-Frame could be. And at some point he asked if I could uh, kind of start consulting with him and start building some of the, the roots of what we were doing. And I started to grow. He started being my biggest consulting uh, 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 client. And eventually it started becoming so big that he wanted me to join to help him build the foundations of what we were doing here. Um, and it was the impact of what we're creating at, at A-Frame, not only with our brands, but also in a new concept of like how we can be able to build businesses was so enticing to me. To to be able to change the way that people can create businesses at, with its roots in diversity, its roots in equity, and its roots in inclusion. I've been so impressed with how you've been able to recruit such a diverse team at A-Frame Brands, as well as the presidents of the individual brands. And I know that that's something that founders and companies out there are struggling with. And I'd love to get your tips on how to bring in diverse talent uh, at the very, very senior levels because you've done such a great job of it at A-Frame and for their underlying brands. There's a lot of work that goes into it. And I think that it's about putting, for lack of a better phrase, your money where your mouth is. Um, if these things are important to you, I, I, you, can, you can do it. And it takes a lot of, we use a lot of active recruiting as opposed to passive recruiting. We use a lot of, um, I always say that there, there's a lot of elements of bias that exist structurally within the way that the world works. And bias is like gravity. You have to work a lot, you have to take a lot, add a lot of process, a lot of systems to be able to try and mitigate it. Just the same way that it takes a lot of work to be able to make a plane fly. You have to 
think about the way that you're, you're building your pipeline. Make sure that your pipeline is, is representative of the world that you want to be able to create within your organization, because that's the only way that you're going to get those kind of candidates to succeed. You need to make sure that, they, that it's equitable, that everyone has the opportunity to succeed and to speak their own story, and that you're even looking at things kind of non-traditionally, that you're looking at transferable skills, um, because not everyone has the um, ability within the industry to, to attain the same levels of, of titles. And those are things that structurally are keeping people away from being able to lead. So never has the, the general manager role, um, but has all of the pieces of that role in their background. Um, they might not be able to gain access to that role unless you look at things a little bit less traditionally. And I, th I think Ari was telling me that um, almost 90% or over 90% of your team was from an underrepresented background or female. And recently there was an article in Fortune about the heads of each of the brands who are all uh, women of, of color. Yeah. And uh, in sort of taking a chance and seeing sort of someone's potential uh, based on their whole background, are there things that you're looking for? Is it, are you looking at their LinkedIn profiles? Are you going to conferences and meeting with people and keeping your Rolodex? Like how, how tactically does that, does that happen? Yeah, there's a lot of different pieces. There's going through a Rolodex to talk to people earlier in the stage of their career. We have um, people, especially in VP levels, that I've talked to years ago that I've watched their career develop and also worked with them to be able to say, oh, you should look at this sort of uh, type of thing in the future to be able to help build your career. Um, and so those are like planting the seeds that we might be able to reap later. Um, it's, but it's also about just going outside of your networks of, on things because uh, these re referral networks also keep people from being able to gain um, access into things. Be able to go out and actively source for people and like I call it reading tea leaves of like you look at people's LinkedIn backgrounds, you look at what types of roles they took on and you start to gain a little bit more of, of, uh, of a narrative of how they look at things, how they might see the world based off of the types of things that they've, that they've worked on in their past. And then you reach out to have a conversation because obviously you're not going to get the full story by just looking at what their but that background looks like on paper and you'll get to see more of that color around them. I know that you've had a lot of professional challenges with getting Avametric acquired and launching uh, Kinlo into uh, you know, over 2,000 Walmart stores, but I, I think what I thought was most meaningful was uh, you know, a personal challenge that you faced as, you were, as your own career was developing. Can you tell us about that? Very early on in my career, actually even before my career, um, I had always wanted to work in the CIA. Um, that's what I, like even when I was like 16, that was like the dream. Um, and um, I spent the next six, more than six years working towards that. I studied counterterrorism in college um, and with a, a Dublin French and a minor in physics because I thought it was interesting to look at nuclear physics or nuclear counterterrorism. I had a mentor that was really focused on, on being able to try and build all of the kind of outside skills around like close quarter combat and, and like bomb defusal and lock picking, those like weird things to just like kind of learn about, uh, around to be able to get a broad, broader set of skills. And I read a lot to be able to try and prepare myself. Um, and I spent after uh, college, I spent a year interviewing with the CIA. At the end of that year, they told me I was a a, an amazing candidate for it, that I would ha have all the skill sets. I would be um, very impactful on the surface on everything that uh, that they needed. But because of my gender identity, because of the way that I expressed it, because of uh, my queerness, um, I wouldn't be able to move forward and I wouldn't be able to, to, to join, um, which was obviously t uh, heartbreaking. It was years of my life that I had spent moving in that direction and trying to accomplish my dream. And at that point, it was I had to figure out how to do something different. Because I come from a, you know, a, a negotiating and a legal <laughs> background, I have to, you know, push back on how they this could be possible and this was only 10 years ago. Yeah, it was only 10 years ago. Don't ask, don't tell had already been repealed. It was in a more progressive administration. Um, but some of these things that you might see at, on the onset of things, I mean, we know organizationally, like the top of, of, of an organization can believe what, what and, and trying to be driving change and some, how things work, but it might get stuck in the middle and it might not be able to create all of the progress as it goes down. It might be very different today. I hope it's very different today, but 10 years ago it wasn't. And so what did you do? Did you, did you try to fight it? 
I, you know, I didn't. I think that uh, I was young and I, I think a diverse populations also, we've seen these things before and I think that we've also been beaten down by it quite a bit. And so um, I accepted it. I said, okay, I, this isn't gonna work out for me. I need to figure out what is my next step? What do I actually wanna do? What is important to me in life and what, like this was the dream. And I think also I was a little bit more of a perfectionist. And so like you're very regimented in like, this is what you wanna do. And when that disappears, what's next? And for me, I was working uh, at a, I was a behavioral analyst, um, working in a police department and do, working in a couple of different labs. I was also leading uh, business operations for a university for all of their research. Um, and there wasn't really a lot of progress opportunity in either of those because I didn't have a PhD for the psych role and university administration just takes years to be able to move up. And so I was looking down the barrel of this uh, uh, experience saying, okay, I will have years and years of doing the same thing over and over. And that didn't seem at all ex uh, exciting to me. So you questioned your career choice, but you didn't question yourself. No, I guess that's true. I didn't question myself because I've always believed that like I am smart, capable and talented. And if you have all of those things and you work hard, you will achieve what you want to achieve. And there might be elements outside of you that can impede things, but like you will always succeed. And it might look, success might look different, but you will always succeed. And so for me, it wasn't me thinking like, oh, well, I'm not good enough for this because frankly, I was good enough for it, but that they had other elements that I couldn't change about myself that I couldn't do anything about. And that brought you to the Bay Area yeah. and the startup world. Yeah, because I, I, was, I was seeing all of my friends working in startups and having a great time and making good money and enjoying the, the, the work, the impactful work that they were doing too. And so I within a span, I, I, one of my friends was visiting me and we were talking about how actually he had a, a space in his apartment because someone had, had moved. Um, and I had this moment of, should I move to San Francisco? <laughs> uh, but like, should I just quit my job, give two weeks notice and move over to San Francisco? And so I, I did, which without a job, without kind of anything other than an apartment, which is obviously great, but no way for pay, to pay for it, I guess yet. <laughs> Um, but then uh, I fell into startups and I realized that I loved it so much because all of the um, experimentation that you could, that all of the things that I loved didn't love in academia about only having to like figure out things to be able to publish, like you could actually instead create impact within startups and you could, you could um, think about, okay, there's, there's so much innovation and there's so much ways about doing things in a new way. I could take all of these like learnings from, from research papers, from academia, from data, and apply it into programmatic ways to be able to make change. Um, and you'll see the, the, the efforts of your work, you'll see the impact of it. Um, and that was so gratifying. And you can actually start building things, you can start building teams, you can build the new business lines. Um, it was so much more fun. I think it's really interesting because I've lived, you know, in, in this body and this gender my whole life, that you have had the experience of, uh, of experiencing a change in how people treat you yes. because of your gender. Yeah. And we like to think that in Silicon Valley, we are uh, better than that. Yeah. And <laughs> I think your experience has been, hasn't been that, case, yeah. that way. And I'd love to dig in a little bit more on, on that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that it's not for trying. <laughs> um, I think that there are innocuous things where like, so I identified as male while working in the business in San Francisco, having all of these connections. And then I transitioned while I was here, which is I think a little more rare, especially these days, because people get to uh, get the opportunity to transition a lot earlier in their life. But that means that I've met a lot of people before and I've met a lot of people after where there's innocuous areas where I'll talk to actually investors way from my earlier on in my career who I worked closely on things who did not recognize me at all years later um, and I'll have to reintroduce myself to them and uh, but there's also I think more less innocuous things where I especially when I was consulting I would have conversations with people um, because there's obviously there's this whole concept of passing in transgender or in queer communities where um, it's about whether people perceive you as trans or not um, and in certain scenarios people don't perceive me as trans and so I'll be having conversations with folks um, and they might say something they'll start making fun of pronouns so they'll start making fun of um, uh, queer identities within San Francisco and it was so odd to me that they would be having these conversations in front of me but it gave me such a weird it, like um, 
whiplash of like, okay, I need to figure out whether this is something that I actually want to work on and that I want to work with these people. And I, with those, I was able to obviously um, shift gears and not, <laughs> not have to work with them. Um, but do you say something in the moment? You know, I think early in my career I wouldn't, but I, then as I started to progress and as I, I honestly started to see more of the ways that my actions would impact the world and could impact the industry, that if I say no here, that, or if I say something here, it can change the way that people think about things. And actually, even just not just this person, but anyone else in the room can recognize that this is not the type of thing that should go on. But I think even especially like experiencing the world in a male identified and experiencing the world female identified, it actually changed the way my, it increased my passion for diversity, equity, inclusion so much. Because I think that the way that I was treated, the way that I worked when I identified as male, when the world saw me as male, was so different than how I was treated when the world saw me as female. And can you provide some examples yeah, of that? Absolutely. Because I've never had the other know, experience, so I don't, I nobody, don't know. It, yeah. it's, <laughs> it's a rare experience. Like I would be working on the same, I would be pitching the same kind of programs, I would be pitching the same kind of, of uh, projects with people. Um, and when I identified as male, it wouldn't be questioned. I w it would just be, I, I, the, lo the logic made sense, everything was fine, I wouldn't get interrupted. Um, all of these kind of different elements, kind of, it was like all, all lights green um, for anything that I wanted to be able to create. When I identified as female, there was so much more pushback. There was so much more asking, asking for the research, which obviously I had, but asking for like the backup, asking, oh, are you sure you know what you're doing? Asking, interrupting, maybe even sometimes not including me in conversations. It, I, instead of all lights green, it was all lights red and all lights having to like push and, and push and push and push. And it was jarring. It was like, I didn't change. Nothing that I was doing changed because it was literally, sometimes it was even within a month span of like, of, of before and after. Um, but the world and the way that the world saw me change. And then how did you shift your tactic for getting heard based on that? I mean, I just had to get louder. I had to ask, I started asking why a lot more. Um, I started having to push and, and ask why people were like, what, it was a lot more of having to honestly just like buckle down and spend the time, which honestly probably meant that like, if I still had identified as male, I probably would have been able to move a lot quicker. And uh, there's a lot more emotional labor that's there, which obviously is a lot more stressful. So unfortunately, I think we just have to, we ha I had to take it on to myself to do it. Thank you for sharing that experience. Yeah. I would just like to ask in closing, you know, if there was a message that you could send to yourself when you were younger, um, and you've had so many experiences uh, since then, what, what would that be? Yeah, I mean, it's tough because like, I, I don't really live with regrets and I think I'm lucky that way. Um, and I think that's mostly because I, I feel like I'm usually very sure of myself of like, it, this is the way, reason why I wanna do this, this is the reason why I, I see this this way and I, I wanna be able to accomplish X, Y, Z. Um, I think it would just be that you are talented, you are incredible, you, are, you will get everywhere that you need to be. Um, sometimes people will treat you like you are not, and that's not your fault. That's the world around you, and, and keep moving and keep going, and, and you'll get there. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you. Avantha Arachi, COO of A-Frame Brands. Uh, really, really appreciate you joining us and, and sharing. Thank you, I appreciate being here.